Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second workshop in the series. Uh, this is going to be fantastic as it was last week. I think Scott is attending again this week. Thank you, Scott, for a brilliant uh, uh, first workshop last week. And uh, I think Jeremy, who will be presenting next week, is also here. So again, thank you, Jeremy, for participating in this series. And without further ado, um, Hilda, would you go ahead and uh, share your slide? Hey, hey, Jeremy, uh, that's Dr. Greenberg, everybody. You'll hear from him next week. Um, so Hilda, you can go ahead and share and get started. Can you yeah, guys yeah. hear me? Yep. Yes. You can hear me, but the subtitles aren't showing now. Okay, uh, we need to, well, let's go ahead without them then. I'm so sorry, you guys. Okay. Um, no I don't no know words. what, yeah, okay. Well, um, welcome. <laughs> um, welcome to part two of our Pathways to Literacy series, um, Language Support Strategies, Low Tech, low tech Practices. Um, I'm Hilda Mann and I will be your speaker for today. Um, I have a couple of announcements before we get into our topic. Um, I want you to know that next week, part three of the series will take place on Saturday, February 18th at 10 a.m. China Standard Time. Um, Dr. Jeremy Greenberg will be the presenter for that workshop entitled Verbal Behavior Analysis Explained. I think it will be a very interesting and enlightening presentation. So please mark your calendars and be sure to join us. And then um, wrapping up the Pathways to Literacy series will be a panel discussion on Saturday, February 25th, also at 10 a.m. China Standard Time. Um, the panel members will be Scott Campbell, who gave an excellent talk last week about his personal journey to personal success as a special needs student. Dr. Jeremy Greenberg, who will be speaking next week, Noelle Roberts, our executive director, and myself. And during the session, we will be addressing questions about the information presented over the previous three weeks. And I hope you will join us for that. Okay, um, the announcements are out of the way and let's begin talking about today's topic, language support strategies, low tech practices. But first of all, let's make sure that we all understand the word tech. What do we mean by tech? Well, tech or technology, which is uh, the longer uh, word, the, the main word for tech, uh, does not necessarily mean electronic devices. Um, I think most people, when they hear the word, they think of something that's electronic. However, technology doesn't necessarily refer to digital devices. Technology actually refers to the way we apply scientific knowledge for practical purposes. And modern technology consists mostly of like electronic and computer related tools and is often referred to as high tech. Um, and then low tech refers to non-digital tools and strategies. But what about assistive technology? I'm sure some of you have heard that word before. Um, assistive technology are products and services and they support a student's ability to participate in the home, school and community. It can be high tech or low tech. Now here's a table that shows some examples of high tech and low tech. As you can see, the things listed under high tech are digital devices, whereas those under low tech include common everyday items. Today, we will focus on low tech tools and strategies that support language and literacy in the areas of listening, speaking, reading, spelling, and vocabulary. But you might be wondering, but why focus on low tech strategies? Well, low tech tools are easily accessible. Um, they don't require a lot of training. Teachers and parents can implement them easily. They don't cost a lot of money. They benefit all students, not just those who are struggling. 
Um, but for those who are struggling, these practices can serve as preventative measures, meaning that if used consistently, they can prevent a student from having to seek special one-on-one -on -one learning support. But how can parents help? Okay. Um, and how can teachers help? By the way, I want to add that these practices that I'm going to share today are ones that I've learned and used over my 40 plus years in the field. Teachers and parents with whom I've worked also utilize them, and we were able to see huge positive gains in our students' ability to engage academically and succeed. Now, the best practices to support listening, that would be the area that we'll talk about first. Listening is very important because without listening and understanding, we can't have speaking, reading, or writing. Let's talk about ambient noise or competing background noise. So background noise can impede listening performance. It can distract and interrupt one's ability to listen. Now, some students hear everything in their environment um, except for what they're supposed to hear. You've heard of students that have ADD or attention deficit disorder. This label is misleading because people with ADD actually don't have a deficit in their attention. They're actually very attentive. They can attend to a lot of things, but what they attend to um, are often things that aren't pertinent to the task at hand. So for example, the low hum of a fan or air conditioner, the ticking of a clock in the room, or the echo in a large room or gymnasium, those are all examples of background noises that can detract from listening. So what we should all do is watch for these and be aware of these noises in our environment and act as best as we can to remove them or lessen their effect in order to create a more ideal listening environment for our students. Take away the clock, close the door or window, turn the fan to a lower setting. Or if you can't remove the sound, then try to move the student away from the noise as as far as you can. Some other environmental modifications that support good listening include adding carpeting, rugs, drapes, acoustic, acoustic ceiling tiles, soft furniture, and wall panels. Why? Because these things help to absorb sound and reduce echoing. Now, teachers often sit a student who struggles with listening and attention in the front of the classroom, but this might not always be the best practice as today's classrooms are more dynamic and the teacher isn't always in the front of the room. It's better to seat the student close to the source of oral messages. If there is a video being shown and the speakers are in the back of the room, it might be better to have the students sit in the back near the speakers. And the teacher can uh, gently tap a student's desk or paper or shoulder to redirect attention. It's really important um, that a teacher do this to prompt the student to, uh, to redirect their attention. Uh, no need to draw the students, um, do no need to draw attention to the student by calling out their name. Now, before you even open your mouth and begin to speak, you should make sure that you are facing the listener. Then obtain the listener's attention. There are many ways you can do this. One way is to walk right up to the student and stand in front of them. And um, just by being there right in their face, uh, they'll start paying attention. Now, oftentimes in the classroom, teachers use what we call attention grabbers. And you might recognize some of these. Um, some teachers say, one, two, three, eyes on me and the students respond in unison, one, two, eyes on you. Or a teacher might say, hocus pocus, and the student's response is, everybody focus. My favorite is counting down from five, and with each number, name a behavior that you expect. For example, I need papers and pencils put away in five, laptops closed in four, students in their chairs in three, mouths closed in two, eyes on me in one. Good, now everyone is ready to listen. 
And again, be sure that your listener can hear your voice and um, be sure that they can see you. I'm just going to back up a little bit. I have a, a comment to make uh, because I'm thinking that maybe some of you might be wondering, but Hilda, these practices that you've these practices that you've just mentioned um, are just common sense strategies. Well, yes, I would agree with you, but I bring them to your attention because often a teacher who's trying to deliver a well-planned lesson in a class full of rambunctious students who are not paying attention will become frustrated and flustered and her common sense thinking might go out the window and her logical thinking will become, will become foggy thinking and she forgets about these preemptive strategies. And if the students are not prepped for listening, they won't listen. So I just wanted to be sure to mention these things to put them on your radar. Now, another thing that I wanna mention is to make sure that the light is, is in front of you. I think that most people don't even think about lighting, but when speaking, make sure that the light is in front of you and not behind you, meaning don't stand in front of the window or stand in front of a light with the light behind you. Because if the light is behind you, your face will be dark. And then the students won't be able to see your facial expressions and they'll miss out on important facial cues. You know, experts agree that um, about 70 to 93% of all communication is nonverbal. So we want to be sure to allow the students um, the ability to access the facial cues that accompany our oral messages. Now, also, it's important to pay attention to your speech. You should use simple and short, short and simple language. If you use a high level vocabulary word, make sure you explain it or provide a synonym. Be sure to speak more slowly and deliberately. I know it's hard to remember. I'm often guilty of talking too fast, but it's less effort have than having to repeat yourself over and over again. Also, emphasize key words for the most important points. This will help the student know where to direct her focus. You might want to start with the main idea and pause between ideas. This structures the message in a way that will assist the students processing. Okay, this next thing that I wanna talk about is something that we should all try to avoid doing when we speak with students. What is it? Adding too much tangential information. If you add tangential information to your message, sometimes it can overwhelm the student if the listening demand is too great. Let me give you an example. A teacher might say, oh, today we're going to learn about Mencius. He was a Chinese Confucian philosopher. He's considered to be second in importance after Confucius, after Confucius himself in the Confucian tradition. Oh, and by the way, we will have a test in two weeks about Mencius and Confucian philosophers when we come back from spring break. So I apologize in advance, but some of you may need to set aside some time during your vacation to review the material and prepare for the test. Okay, so while that part about the upcoming test is important, it really shouldn't be mentioned during the lesson. Bring it up before or after instead. Because a student, um, if there's too much to listen to, might shut down. And um, it's because he finds it difficult to focus on what is important. He wouldn't be able to discern what is pertinent and he will focus on the wrong part of the message. So in the example I just gave about mentions, a student might zoom in on the fact that there's a test coming up and not even pay attention to the name of the philosopher nor what he was known for. Now it's really important for students <clears throat> when repetitions of directions are provided but don't feel like you have to repeat everything. Read the room and see if your students register comprehension on their faces, but you don't have to do all the repeating. You could ask another student to repeat for you, or you can ask another adult in the room. In this way, the students get to hear the directions again, 
And if it was a student who did the repeating, they'll probably repeat it in their own words, which may make the language easier for the student to comprehend. Now, some other considerations uh, to support listening. Um, when you do repeat, it's important to watch out about watch out for paraphrasing because sometimes if you paraphrase, the student will then have a new message to process and remember because they're different words. Um, and then it will make the student um, more stressed out about having something new to, to remember. Use your voice to emphasize, just, uh, with, emphasize using your voice, gestures, and movement. It's a great strategy for helping students know which part of the message is important. And it's important to check in frequently for understanding. Don't just ask, do you understand? But ask the student to repeat in their own words because many of you already know students will often just say yes, just to have you move on. So make sure that you check with them but if they say they don't remember, you can prompt by saying, well, tell me what you do remember. And then you fill in the gaps. Provide visual support. Everybody knows this. Visual support is very important and helpful because more and more our society today is becoming a visual world where everyone relies on visual stimuli. Gone are the days when families sat around the family table of uh, uh, gone are the days when families sat around the family radio to listen to a story being broadcasted. Today, we watch those stories in the form of movies, videos, and TV shows. Young people watch music videos instead of just listening to the songs. So what kind of visual support can we provide? We can provide pictures. We can provide visual schedules, videos, handouts, outlines, notes, models, props, facial expressions, gestures, graphic organizers. What are graphic organizers? Well, they're tools that organize ideas and information visually. Examples of graphic organizers include tables, charts, graphs, diagrams, mind maps, timelines, flow charts, and bubble maps. All right, now I'm gonna talk about speaking and oral language supports. It's important to talk with your child, not at him. Try to avoid being the know-it-all. Yeah, you the adult, you do know more than the child, but conversations should be a back and forth type of interaction. Let your child know that you value what he has to say. This would make him more apt to verbally express to you his thoughts, ideas, and opinions. Also, it's important to play word games with children. Actually, this is one of my most favorite things to do and to recommend to families. Playing word games can enhance language fluency and literacy skills. They help students to be more word conscious, which aids in vocabulary development and language expansion. I also like to recommend that people read wordless picture books. I love wordless picture books and I have a whole library full of them. They're an excellent tool for eliciting language fluency because there's no right way to tell the story. Children aren't stifled by the pressure of having to tell a specific story. And so they feel free to make up their own story. Sometimes I write what the child says on sticky notes and put the notes on the page. When we're done with the book, we combine all the notes and publish the child's story. At the end of the PPT today, you will find lists of some wordless picture books that you might want to try. I also like to recommend that you do fun activities together. 
When you share an activity, you give your child something to talk about. It's important to provide them with many such opportunities for oral expression so their language skills can grow. Everyday mundane tasks can be turned into a language development activity. Cooking, baking, shopping, gardening, doing the laundry. You can talk about what you're doing while engaged in the task and predict outcomes. Like, I bet this cake will come out fluffy. Now, if you're struggling for ideas for what to do with your children, I often get that from parents. They say, I don't know what to do with my kid. Here's, there's a website that shares kid concoctions with three ingredients or less. They provide 35 different recipes. And uh, some examples are galaxy slime. That sounds kind of cool. Um, Jello silly putty. These are great bonding and talking activities. And here's the web address. Don't worry about writing it down now because again, this PPT will be shared with you and you can go back to retrieve it later. I also encourage everyone to have conversations during everyday situations. It's more natural and mealtimes are an excellent time to have family conversations. You, um, you can talk about your day and then you can ask about their day. Make sure you don't judge or criticize, but listen attentively with obvious interest. Now, I also recommend that families go shopping together because when you do, you can point out categories. For example, in the grocery store, you can talk about, oh, these are all fruits or here we've got vegetables and these are all dairy or meat or snacks. At the department store, you can point out, oh, the, this section is clothing. And here we've got shoes and appliances. And why is this important? Because categories help to organize our words for easier access and retrieval. Compare and contrast items. Teachers always do this with their students. It's really good and parents should try doing it as well. You want to point out similarities and differences in shape, size, texture, taste, and function between items. You want to encourage your, your child to use the senses like seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, tasting. For example, an orange and an apple look alike because they're both round but they're different because an orange has a thick rind and an apple has a thick skin. Being able to compare and contrast items enhances one's ability to understand words and word relationships more deeply. Next, I wanna talk about questions. We always love to ask kids questions, that's fine, but to encourage good language expression, we should try to avoid yes, no questions. Instead, ask open-ended open questions or forced choice questions. Instead of saying, um, did you have a good day? You might say, oh, well, what was the best part of your day? Or tell me about the science experiment you did today. And if the child doesn't respond or keeps saying, I don't know, or I don't remember, then give them that forced choice question. Is it A or is it B? Did your space rocket take off or did it just stay on the table? This way, the student at least has to think about the question and then choose an answer. Now, if a student or your child asks you a question, make sure you don't just ignore it. Pay attention to their questions because um, when they ask you a question, it's a great opportunity to, opportunity to engage with them and to stimulate language use. Now, asking questions is good, but asking too many isn't. Sometimes you might want to turn your questions into comments. So instead of asking your child, what is daddy doing? You might say, oh, look, daddy is petting the dog. It's a nice dog. Turning your questions into comments exposes your child to richer language and language structures. And by modeling language, you can help your child develop language skills more quickly.
I also recommend that people recast and elaborate on a child's utterances. For example, if the child says back, meaning she wants a piggyback ride, then you say, yes, daddy will give you a piggyback ride. You don't wanna say, no, don't say back, say it this way, daddy give me a piggyback ride because if you chastise the child, then they might be uh, more apt to close down and not talk. So just kind of recast and model for them. This um, allows them to hear good language models. Um, a teacher might um, recast by saying, uh, okay, so the student answers, Mencius was a philosopher. When you ask who was Mencius, then you can elaborate by saying, yes, that's right. Mencius was a Confucian philosopher who's best known for his theory of human nature. Now let's move on to reading practices. I always encourage families to read together. I ask parents to read with the children every day, even when they're in high school. When you read, be excited about the reading. Read with expression. Summarize what was read. By the way, um, you know, we talk with expression, so we should also read with expression. And then be sure to recap or summarize what you read. Also, model the habit of reading for pleasure. Children tend to do as we do, rather than as we say. So if they see you reading, they would be more apt to do so themselves. And when you read, it's a good practice to write notations in the book margins or use sticky notes. You can write down questions that you have, some associations or reactions. It's a good practice to do, but even better if you teach students or your child to do it. It encourages active reading. Being active rather than passive with the reading helps with comprehension and retention. Okay, I mentioned visuals before, and I mentioned it again because visualization or concept imagery is a very important strategy. As I said earlier, today's world is a highly visual one, but our students increasingly rely on outside sources to, to provide them with the visual cues. We need to help them create their own visual images. Prompt the student to visualize what they are reading. Books for younger children have illustrations but older students need to provide their own pictures. And as I said again, uh, today's society is more visual than ever before. So what I often call this is making movies in their minds when they visualize. This is a term I, ad I adopted from the Linda Mood Bell program called Visualizing and Verbalizing. It's a whole program that talks about making movies in their minds and helping kids to um, visualize what they hear or what they read. And you can look these people up online to learn more about them. Um, here's an article that talks a little bit about um, visualization and um, concept imagery. Now, when reading with your child, model and encourage the think aloud strategy. Thinking aloud allows your child to eavesdrop on your thinking. Thinking aloud helps children while reading to interact with the text before, during, and after reading. Think alouds activate prior knowledge and they assist in making connections. This strategy prompts students to make visual images, assess understanding, engage in dialogue with the author, make predictions and inferences about the text. And by the way, when I talk to younger kids about inferences, I call them smart guesses. It's less intimidating. Um, think alouds also involve asking questions about what is being read and they facilitate the student um, to react to the reading. So how does it work? 
Well, um, there are cue words that you can use. Uh, for example, I see blah, 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 or I picture this and that. This is like, this reminds me of, this is similar to, if it were me, why did, what did, how did, where was, should there, I wonder, <coughs> I predict. In the next part, I think, I think this is, I'm confused about. You say these while you're reading for your child. For example, you read the sentence, James fell off his bicycle. You can think aloud and say, oh, that reminds me of the time when I fell off my bicycle and I broke my ankle. I wonder if James will break his ankle too. You don't need to wait for an answer from the child. You just move on. Your child can choose to respond or not, but since you're just thinking aloud, you shouldn't expect them to respond as it's not a conversation. All right, now let's talk about spelling. Visual imagery. <laughs> yep, Excuse talking about me. visuals again. Hello? Are you gonna take questions at the end? Yes. Okay, I'll save it. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so visual imagery means seeing and remembering what a word looks like. It's also referred to as symbol imagery. It's good for sight words because sight words aren't sounded out. Students have to remember what these words look like. Some students memorize letter sequences or they use mnemonic strategies. One mnemonic strategy I learned when I was little was how to spell arithmetic. A rat in the house may eat the ice cream. A-R-I-T-H-M-E-T-I-C. But visual imagery skills allow for quicker and more efficient self-correcting while reading. So prompt your student to remember what the word looks like uh, by having them focus on the word and then ask them to close their eyes and see if they can still see the word on the inside of their eyelids. If they say no, then have them look at the word again and then try to close their eyes and see it again. And that trains them to um, develop some symbol imagery skills. Verbal mediation. This is using language to direct your thinking. Now, often this is a strategy that we as adults apply to our own thinking, but it's also something we can do for our students. For spelling, we can use verbal mediation to direct a student's attention to how the letters are formed. You want to point out the salient features and characteristics of the letters and the words. For example, see how the S looks like a snake. I see two Ps in this word. And for Chinese characters, you can point out the symmetry of the character or where the radical is located. Orthographic awareness. Now, orthographic awareness are the skills for knowing the rules regarding letter order, positions, combinations for words in the language. For example, words in English aren't spelled with NG in the beginning, nor are they spelled with J at the end. There's also the I before E except after C rule, and every word has a, at least one vowel. Now, this is a, an important skill for writing Chinese characters because a, a student needs to know the rules regarding stroke order and position of radicals. Morphological awareness. This refers to understanding that words can be broken into smaller units of meaning. In English, this, re, this includes roots, prefixes, and suffixes. For example, the plural marker S and ES, or the past tense marker of ED, or the present, progressing, present progressive ING. In Chinese, it includes the understanding of compound words such as Huang Jin versus Jin Huang. And also, it helps uh, to differentiate uh, between. Uh, the Chinese characters that include the root ma. So um, you can have horse or a question word or mother 
or a number or a code, uh, all with the root of ma. Now, if you notice that your student misspells morphological markers in words, such as using a Z to indicate plurality in the word dogs, or a T to indicate past tense in the word jumped, you'll know that you should work on morphology to improve, to improve their spelling. Phonemic awareness skills. These are the skills for learning how to, these are the skills for hearing, identifying, and manipulating individual sounds in spoken words. Now, even though these sounds are not as important for learning to read and write Chinese characters, um, our Chinese students need to have these skills because it's vital for English literacy skills. Now, if a student spells a word in the illogical sequence, or they add letters for sounds that aren't there, or they omit letters because they didn't hear all the sounds, it means they need to improve their phonemic awareness skills. And these skills are really important because they're strong predictors of literacy success in English. So what are some things that you can do for phonemic awareness? Well, you can play phonemic awareness games with your students to improve these skills. One game is to look for things in the environment that begin with a particular sound or that end with a particular sound. Keep in mind that beginning sounds are easier. So let's find something in this room that begins with b, or let's find something in this room that ends with m. Another game you can play is placing hula hoops or some other space demarker on the floor and have students jump into as many hoops as there are sounds in a presented word. Kids really like this because it incorporates movement. Some other phonemis, phonemic awareness activities include doing rhyming. It's amazing. Uh, kids who really struggle with phonemic awareness, they really can't rhyme. So, you know, you can play games like, um, here's the word cat. Let's name some words that rhyme with cat, hat, rat, sat, bat. But if a kid can't do that yet, you might just ask them to tell you if two words rhyme or not. Cat, bat, yes. Cat, kit, no. Read books that play with language and words. Those are really fun. Dr. Seuss books are really good for this. In the resources section at the end of this PPT, you know, I've listed some books that promote phonemic awareness. Some of you are familiar with the song, O MacDonald. I like to suggest a variation of the song. So instead of E-I-E-I-O, you can insert a target sound such as K and sing Ki Kai Ki Kai Ko. So O MacDonald had a farm, Ki Kai Ki Kai Ko, you know, and, or you can change it to a mm and sing Me My Me My Mo. Also, um, having students spell um, using different mediums would be fun. Chinese teachers know the importance of having students write a word a number of times before you can remember how to write it, but it's tedious and most students begrudge having to do so. So make it more fun by having them write the words with different mediums, such as chalk, sand, Play-Doh or clay, crayons, paint, watercolor, glitter glue, magic words. In case you don't know what magic words are, it's when a student writes a word on um, white paper using a white crayon, and then they co color over the word with a different color crayon to reveal the word. You could also, also let them use rice and beans. Sound walls. This is a relatively new idea. Um, it's uh, something that teachers can post on the wall in their classroom. It's different from the traditional sound wall because sound, um, it's different from word walls because sound walls are displayed according to the articulation of sounds rather than the spelling. So for example, the word knee 
would be placed under N and not K. Celery would be found under S and not C. They also have pictures of the mouths forming the sounds and those pictures are next to the, the words so that in case a student uh, forgets how to make a sound, they can go up and look at the, the mouth pictures. And there are two charts, one for consonants and one for, uh, for vowels. Here's a link to an article that explains sound walls in more detail. Okay, now I wanna move on to vocabulary strategies. I've got a couple of comments about vocabulary instruction. A student's vocabulary knowledge is closely related to their reading comprehension. And new terms must be defined using language and examples already familiar to the student. You know, if a student can't understand what they're reading, um, it's likely because they don't know the words on the page and they don't know what those words mean. Uh, when you're teaching new words, the definitions should con contain language and examples that are already familiar to the students and don't use the vocabulary word in the definition. For example, we don't say confusion means when you feel confused. We can say confusion is when you can't understand or think clearly like when people talk to each other in a different language and no one understands what the other is saying, that's confusion. So how much exposure to a new word does a student need before she learns it? Typically, a student needs to hear a word 17 times before learning it. Students who have difficulty learning uh, words and developing vocabulary need to learn it, need to hear it 40 times to be able to use the new vocabulary across the four different types of vocabulary, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Now, when I say 40 repetitions, I don't mean merely saying it over and over 40 times. We need to present the word in different meaningful ways. For example, if I'm teaching the word marker, I wouldn't say, this is a marker, say it, marker, say it again, marker, again, marker. And Instead, I'd show a marker and then I'd explain what it is and then use the word a number of times during that day's class and in subsequent classes. I would say, this is Miss Hilda's marker. Whose marker is it? Is it Lindsay's marker? No, it's Miss Hilda's marker. What, I, what might I do with my marker? Well, I'm going to use my marker now to draw a star on the map. Here's the star that I drew with my marker. It may sound annoying, but it works. Now, of course, um, that was very simplistic, but increase the um, complexity of the language for older students. Word walls. Okay, earlier I mentioned sound walls. Word walls are for, I mean, sound walls are used for spelling. Word walls help with vocabulary. And it's good to use them to post content vocabulary for different subjects. For instance, math, science, computers. You can also make a word wall for parts of speech and you can add, have your students add their own words to the walls. Be sure to update your word walls often. And parents can, parents can do word walls at home by posting new words on the refrigerator or on the kid's bedroom door. If space is a challenge, you can hang flashcards on a key ring on the kitchen wall or write them on your child's bathroom mirror. Somebody has their mic on. Um, all right, I'm gonna keep talking. Uh, trading cards. Instead of traditional flashcards, you can have students create trading cards for new vocabulary terms or historical figures. It's a fun and creative way to learn and remember new words. And students can make up games to play with each other using the cards. There are a variety of templates available online for you to download and just search trading cards. 
Next, I want to talk about the picture word inductive model. This is when you give the student a picture and you ask them to brainstorm words from the picture. For this picture, a student might name customer, deli meats, glass case, salad, store clerk, sausage, meat slicer, scale, store manager, wine, purse, counter, tongs, tile floor, ceiling lights. Okay, so the students brainstorm the words related to the picture. Then they divide the words into categories. They will add other words to the categories and those words don't necessarily have to be in the picture. Then they make sentences with the words and then put the sentences into categories. And then they convert the sentence categories into paragraphs and then arrange the paragraphs into essays. Another good vocabulary activity is word source, sorts. We have closed word sorts and open word sorts. Closed word sorts are when students are given a list of words and told how to group the words. For example, sort the words according to whether they are solid, liquid, or gas, or group the animals according to whether they have hooves or paws. The focus of this activity is the, the student's thinking process and their reasoning. Here's an example of a science word sort. You give the students the categories of clouds, climates, and weather conditions, and then you ask them to put the words in the proper groups. Open word sorts, the specific way for sorting the words is not given. There's no one right way to sort the words, but the students are not allowed to put all the words in one group or they can't have a different group for each word. The focus of this activity is the process that the students use to complete the activity. Make sure the students discuss the rationale for their groupings. I also like to recommend that people use um, semantic continuums or gradients as a vocabulary task. You give the students a continuum of words that they need to think about by order of degree. You supply them with a gradient with, with antonyms on either end. For example, here we have biggest and smallest. The students arrange the words on the gradient according to how close they are in meaning to the antonyms. You encourage the students to, to explain the rationale. And this activity broadens and deepens students' understanding of words that are related. In this example, a student might see the word ginormous and think that that is the biggest in the list and that microscopic is the smallest. So they place the words at either end of the gradient like this. So ginormous is at the top where biggest is and then microscopic would be down at the bottom where smallest is. Next, we have hink pinks. I love hink pinks. They're rhyming word riddles. The answer is a pair of words that rhyme with each other. For example, an obese feline is a fat cat and brave mushroom is bold mode. A two syllable hink pink is a hinky pinky and a three syllabled one is a hinkity pinkity. Here's a link to a game using hink pinks. Commonyms. Commonyms are a group of words that have a common trait. For example, a door, a painting, eyeglasses. What do they all have in common? They have frames. 
Now, there's a board game called Tribon that has threezer, threezer riddles or commonims, and you can buy that at the store or on Taobao. Um, you can also find commonims online, and here's a link. Okay, I mentioned earlier word games. They're a really effective tool and worth mentioning again. They increase word, increase word consciousness and they make kids feel comfortable with words. Some word games that I would recommend include Pictionary, Charades, Heads Up, Scategories, Tribond, Apples to Apples, Taboo, Scrabble, 20 questions, and guess who? And many of these are also available as an app for your mobile device. Jokes and riddles. Jokes and riddles are great because they often include multi multiple meaning words, which are homographs, and words that sound alike, which are homophones. They enhance flexible thinking and critical thinking and problem solving skills. Riddles are popular in Chinese culture. Last weekend um, in China, they celebrated the Chinese, what is it, the Lantern Festival, and there were many lanterns with riddles written on them displayed. All right, so let's help our students be successful. I hope that some of these strategies and practices that I mentioned today spoke to you and that you can go and implement them uh, in your daily practices with your students. And I think we have time for some questions. Yes, uh, questions, anyone? I There were some questions before. I can read you uh, one or two. Uh, how to help kids improve their critical thinking by reading, asking open questions. What is the better way? Um, so if they don't know how, it's best to model. You ask a question, you do the think aloud, and you say, oh, I wonder, and then you model your thinking, and then you answer it. I wonder, um, you know, what the character is feeling, or I wonder how Johnny is going to get himself out of this uh, predicament. Maybe he will do blah, blah, blah. So you model that kind of thinking and then you help them um, to see how it works. Great. I think Karen had a question. Go ahead, you can ask. Yes, uh, so I love what you're presenting. Uh, I Thank am you. working in a university in, in China and my students are sophomores and they're supposed to go to America so it's a, a high pressure situation where they have to learn language. And the, the thing I'm questioning, uh, I'm, not, I'm not challenging you, but this is a question I have in my mind about the whole thing about visual. So my students are not grouped. I have three classes, they're not grouped according to level. So I have all levels in each class. So like some kids that really hardly know or they hardly know any English and then some that are like proficient and going to the advanced level. And, but we have a content oriented class, but I'm using ESL strategies to support the learning, but we're learning a class that's, that's from their university in America where they're gonna go. So we have this highly visual society right now and, and I'm older and when we were little, we did not have all this visual stuff. So the question I have is, I feel like they're too dependent on all the pictures and stuff if I keep supplying. And with my content course, it's sometimes difficult to find pictures. It's more using words like tables, graphs, outlines, that kind of thing. Uh, I have a technical writing class. And so, because they're, they're, sci they're science majors. So I'm just wondering if my thought is legitimate because I don't know if I'm, I want them to rely more on their listening and their thinking than on the pictures, but I don't know if I'm uh, crippling them in some way in the learning process. I mean, I, I think it's kind of an advanced skill to, 
to depend on just the words written on the board and in my explanations and et cetera. And I do give examples, but anyway, that's the essence of my question. And if it's not, if you don't really understand, I can rephrase it. I, I think I've got what you're asking, Kara. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, our young people rely on visuals today, whereas, you know, um, I'm older and I didn't have that growing up. Um, and yes, we want them to start being able to uh, supply their own visuals. Um, that's why um, the, the program like the Linda Mood Bell Visualizing and Verbalizing program is really good because it teaches kids to supply their own visuals. Teachers are not always going to be able to supply the visuals. It's good in the beginning to help them and to supplement um, and it helps to keep their attention. But when they're in college uh, at the university age, they should start to supply their own visuals. And what you would do is then prompt them to visualize. Um, you would give them some clues, like you would say, okay, um, if you're teaching science, you know, um, you know, I don't know what, but maybe, um, oh, a microscope. You know, you, you would then talk about um, the way that Teachers always teach vocabulary. You teach all the different um, characteristics, um, like what it's made of, what shape, um, what is the texture, what is the size, compare it to something, you know, and help them to visualize. If they still can't see it, it's okay. But as long as they understand all the different um, characteristics and features of that word, then they can start to uh, supply their own visuals and then challenge them to go um, on their own and look it up on the internet um, to find a picture. Yeah. Does that help? Yes, that helps. Um, because my feeling is exactly what you said is, I'm not doing um, elementary school language. They're already college students and they're students in a 985 university. So that means they're intelligent and they've worked hard. And so they have a lot of skills already. They, they simply lack a lot of the English skills. But I think what the key was, what you told me is to learn, to help them learn to visualize more. I have not done that. So, it's because hard. you know, even when, like in a situation like this, you gave us a lovely PowerPoint, but right now we're talking, we don't use visuals. We talk to each other and, and if they're going to engage in conversations with their teachers, of course, the teachers in America supply a PowerPoint and there are probably tons of visuals, but I'm just thinking in life, we don't always have visuals. It's just not realistic. Right, right. But, um, you know, the classroom is is not really real life either because you're teaching them things. And so you want them to be able to get the information. Um, yes. And so you, you want to supply some visuals to help them to, to support the learning. But again, you do want to get them to become more independent and to start yes. um, making their own visual, visualizations. I think- Yeah, I don't want you to think I supply zero visuals. I do no. supply some. I didn't but... think that at all. <laughs> <laughs> Well, probably, Beam, I probably don't apply, supply enough. Yeah. But, Beam, um, has a, Beam has a, a, a comment to make on, on this regard. Beam, would you like to say something? She did? Oh, I read the comment in, yeah. the, in the box. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's yeah. a really... Yeah, so that's ask really, the students... That's to, really helpful. Right, correct. Yeah. Ask the students to provide visuals. Um, visual material. So again, uh, it's not all coming from you. Sounds great. Um, there's another question here. Um, how to help kids improve their structuralized thinking and writing skills through reading? So um, when teaching reading, um, you know, I my 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 talk is not about reading, but I can talk about that a little bit. Um, you want to teach text structure too when you teach reading. You want to teach them um, about the title, the um, topic sentence, the supporting details, paragraphs, introduction paragraphs, supporting paragraphs, you know, all that. You teach that 
um, by having them read uh, articles and passages that have all that, and then you point it out and you show them and you highlight them in different colors. Let's all, let's highlight the topic sentence in each of these paragraphs in pink. Okay, let's find all the deep supporting details and highlight them in blue. And then once they can do that in the reading, then um, they can carry that over to writing and you can give them a, um, a graphic organizer or a visual uh, organizer with those kinds of prompts so that they can start writing that way. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Okay. Yes, uh, I do have. Yeah. Okay. Actually, Scott was first, so I'll wait for Scott. Well, I, I just uh, wanted to jump in on uh, Hilda and say uh, I loved a lot of those low tech strategies. Um, I myself, uh, being a technology teacher, um, you know, sometimes I see that we get lost in this idea of technology and implement technology for the sake of technology. Um, and the scene and thinking about these low tech strategies that, that work um, is, is phenomenal. And, and one that really resonated with me that you talked about was just the idea of going shopping with your parents. And that was actually something that my mother did with me every weekend until I was 18 and moved out to college. She took me shopping uh, and it was a great way for me to, to learn new words and to be able to speak with my mother and have that modeled English uh, in a safe and supportive environment. Um, and now well, while I'm in China, uh, my, my wife loves the convenience of online shopping and she never really quite understands the reason why I want to get in the car, drive to the shopping center um, and go shopping with the children. Um, but for me, uh, this is actually a really important way for me to start learning Chinese now that I'm in a new environment. Um, but there's just so many uh, situations where you know, sometimes the simplest solution is the best and works. Um, and I just loved how you just talked about so many simple solutions that work across mediums that that work no matter what. Um, so I just wanted to kind of uh, kind of jump on that and also kind of share my experiences just on you know, the value of parents in interacting, especially with those younger kids, uh, those family dinners, those shopping trips. Uh, they might seem insignificant, but looking back at my own experience as you know an, an adult those were actually probably the most profound moments in me developing uh, my oral communication skills and those oral communication skills going on to then help develop those literacy skills afterwards. Great, great. There's a question here, uh, Hilda. Uh, in the childcare center I'm working, we have very young kids who were born in English speaking countries and then came back to China at one year old or two years old. How can the center teachers help them with their oral language since the language environment has changed? That's a very good question, Helen. Um, when children learn language, we want to target their foundation skills. So um, it doesn't matter if it's English or Chinese or Japanese or Korean. Um, you want to give them um, as much language stimulation in whatever language you feel confident in. Don't feel that you have to speak English if your English isn't good, or don't feel like you have to speak Chinese if your Chinese isn't good. Talk to the kids in whatever language you um, are good in and help them to build a, found, a foundation. Because if they learn a concept, let's say they learn the concept of honesty, and they know the word in Chinese because here they are in China and they learn that word. Well, when they get older and they learn the word in English, all they have to do is learn the new vocabulary word, but they already have the concept um, in their foundation. Um, I don't have a whiteboard here with me, but I, would, I often want to uh, draw a dual iceberg for people to see. Again, I, I like to use visuals, but um, if you can picture two icebergs um, sticking out of the water, but underneath they share a common foundation. They're both one iceberg at the bottom and then they stick out and you've got these two points on the top. So under the water, you've got the foundation skills, which are um, you know, the concepts and the knowledge and that kind of thing. 
And then what's sticking up on the top, one iceberg you see is English vocabulary and the other one is Chinese vocabulary and then maybe pronunciation. But down in the um, foundation are those, those concepts. So, you know, just model language as, as you um, feel comfortable. Don't worry about the fact that they were exposed to English early on. Um, they're still just kind of learning because um, when kids develop language, uh, you know, first they just want to, you want to teach them words and concepts. And then as they learn more, then they start to use the words to think. And as they think, they can learn more words and more concepts. And this is really nice um, snowball effect. I hope that makes sense. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Hilda. Anybody else? I think there's somebody else. Yes, Karen, go ahead. Uh, so um, I, I love emergent literacy. It's such an interesting topic. And in the, in, when you're learning a first language, like you mentioned, we have to listen for a long time. And then we start speaking and then later reading and writing. I don't think there's necessarily an order because I've seen kids, some kids read first and some kids write first before they read. But my theory, which I'm starting to question was that in learning a second language, so I've been studying Chinese. The first thing I wanted to do was learn listening and speaking. And they, the teacher wanted to teach me to read and write at the same time as listening and speaking. And it really bothered me. So I just did the first two, but um, now I'm wondering, because I studied French in America, and we did learn all four at the same time. So with language theory, is this um, legitimate to follow the same pattern as the first language when you're learning the second? Or is it okay to learn all four skills at the same time when you're learning a second language? Like I learned French when I was young, and the alphabet obviously is the same as English, whereas Chinese is not. But I didn't have a choice at that time, and I didn't even think about it. I just went to school and did what they said, but I was able to do it. And now I'm kind of wondering if I were to do Chinese over again, if I would try to do all four at the same time. And I just wanted to know what you thought or anybody else about that. There are um, conflicting theories about how to develop a second language. But what I will say is when you are older, and you have a language system already under your belt, then you can use that to help you with the second language. Um, and so, um, like you, if you already know how to read and write um, in English, then you use those skills to help you to access the second language. Whereas if you were just learning uh, Chinese as a kid, as your first language, you, you you would learn it all at the same time, you're right. Um, and that's where we, we um, get into that area where I was talking about earlier, um, where kids have to learn the vocabulary in the four different types of vocabularies, um, speaking, listening, writing, and reading. Um, and so when you're young and learning a language, learning language for the first time, it's good to learn them all together when you get to kindergarten or you know pre-k um, but as an adult it's different okay thank you so much and then noel uh somebody mentioned in the chat that you had something out i think i'll look into that okay. from the past that you did oh yeah 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 um yes i can send that in the group if you'd like later on okay great anybody else any I, other questions I, yes go I, ahead I, John. I, i'd like to add one comment about the learning a second language piece, um, reading and writing versus speaking and listening. I think that ultimately it depends on the purpose of learning the second language. Are we learning a second language to be able to talk to friends or to have a conversation in the workplace? Or are we learning a second language mostly in order to prepare uh, written documents? You know, I think that the, the relevance factor ought to be the determinant because that's going to result in how much practice you get and how much opportunity to respond you get ultimately later. So, you know, if you're working in a library, maybe the speaking part's not that relevant, but if you're working in a factory, maybe the written piece is, is, is going to be, you know, more uh, salient and, and you're going to get more practice at it. So I would, 
kind of say like, why are you learning a second language? Is it for fun? You know, um, well, then probably it's for speaking purposes, right? For social socialization and all that kind of thing. So I, I would encourage people to consider that piece when, because it's difficult to learn a second language. It takes a lot of practice. Yeah, you can do all four at the same time, but it's going to take longer, right? Just like in, in, in bilingual households, um, children who grow up in bilingual households tend to speak later because there's just so much coming at them from both directions. It takes their little brains a little longer to sort it all out. They become bilingual, but they're delayed initially. Like when they show up to kindergarten at five years old, they're not able to do everything that all the other children are because they've, they've got double the, the work effort. So anyway, I'll just leave that there. I agree with you. Thank you so much for that, Jeremy. I, I yeah. want to add to that too. Um, mm. Yeah, if you only want to learn a second language for social purposes, that's that's the BIX that people yeah. have been throwing around, you know, that Noel, Noel did a presentation on. BIX is just the basic interpersonal communication skills. And so you don't need the reading and writing for BIX. But yeah. like you said, if you want to use it for more academic things, um, then you want, you're going to develop CALP. And so then, yeah, you, you do... Um, I find that by learning to read, I never knew how to read Chinese when I was growing up, but when I went to China, I started learning to read and write, um, and it helped my Chinese vocabulary so much more mm -hmm. because um, you can see like homonyms and homophones and homographs, and you can see how things compound words and how they go together. And you know, you, it's like learning root words in English. And, and affixes and prefixes, you know, it, it, once you learn some of them, you, you know a lot more words. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that would be the reason for learning to read and write. Mm. Right. Okay, any other questions? Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Hilda. Thank you, Scott. Any other questions? Thank you, Karen, Dean. Well done, Hilda. Really, well done. really well done. powerful information. You Thank you. I'm so sorry about well. the subtitles. I hope yeah. everyone was able to understand English. <laughs> yeah. we'll see. That's all right. We'll we'll work it out. We'll work it out. Well, so, if they no, didn't you're know the thinking. listening, <laughs> they that? could read it anyway. If they didn't understand you're speaking, they could read it anyway, maybe. Right, right. right. Yeah, that, that's why I do my PowerPoints that way. Um, so that, I mean, normally that is not the way to use the PowerPoint, right? Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to have everything that you say on there. But I did because I want people to be able to walk away with a PowerPoint and have the information with them. By the way, we have Helen Gao, who is participating uh, this evening, who is a part of our, our group. And she is on standby. If anyone would have asked a question in Chinese, she would have been there to help us out. So, yeah. Thank you, Helen, for all for being there last week and coming again this week. Okay. All right. Um, thanks, folks. I think that that's it for today. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you all next Saturday. Hilda, well done. Thank you so much. Jeremy, Thank you all for attending. All right, everyone. Okay. Bye bye.